It's a pleasure to have uh, Barbara Giunti from uh, TU Graz today, who will be telling us about the average complexity of barcode computation for Vietoris Rips filtrations. Take it on. Thank you. So thank you for the, to the organizer for the opportunity to present this work. And uh, uh, yes, so this is a joint work with Guillaume Mori, who is a master's student in Paris. And Michel Cava, which I think basically all of you know, is a professor here at Theograd. Uh, and please, if, if you have any question, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I, I try to keep an eye on the, on the chat, but also unmute yourself. I, I like discussion. So. Okay, so average complexity of barcode computation. I don't think I really need to convince this audience that persistent homology is very cool and we absolutely want to compute it uh, efficiently. So I think you're already convinced of that. But if you want more convincing, um, I'm taking care together with Yanis Lazowski of a TDA, a data set of TDA application. We have over 200 applications of persistent homology. So uh, having a way to compute efficient barcodes, efficient to compute the barcode efficiently is, is important. So efficiently means also understanding what is uh, the algorithm is about. And uh, the point is, we have many barcodes algorithms, many, many way to compute it. The most, uh, uh, the, the way that works better in practice have, we know the bound on the worst case complexity, but we also know that we don't really observe them too much when we actually do uh, computation. So for that, I will uh, refer both to the PATH FAT paper uh, of Bauer, Kerber and others. And also there is the famous roadmap in computation. Roadmap in persistent homology. Uh, so where they have a series in both papers, there are a series of benchmarks showing that actually in practice, uh, persistent computation is quite fast. Uh, what I mean with worst case, in, if you're not familiar with complexity theory, so usually we have an algorithm, okay? And I have a certain input of size n. And then this algorithm is performing a series of operation. Maybe it has a for loop and inside it has a while loop. I don't know if this does not look like a good algorithm, but it happens. And worst cases is, okay, I just assuming that everything that can go wrong, it does go wrong. So it does go wrong. So I have to loop completely for all the, all the value of the for, I have to loop completely for all the value of the while and such. But this is not the only way to compute complexity. So for example, we can have the average complexity, uh, which is what we are gonna study today. So average complexity means that I have a random model, random variable. Okay. That is good somehow at modeling my input. For Okay, and now what I want to study is, okay, I can see the algorithm as a series of operation and I want to study the expected, so the average of uh, what it takes because this is a random variable, so also its expectancy it is. And so I can just study what happened into that. Uh, matrix reduction, and we focus on that because the most efficient algorithm that we have uh, for per, uh, computing persistent homology are basically Gaussian elimination. but harder. So if we want to reduce a matrix using Gaussian elimination, we can do a lot of things. We can sum columns, uh, I mean, two different columns with a multiplier for a scalar, we can swap them and it's the same thing with rows. But in persistent, we can only do one type of this operation, which also means that we cannot use to study, uh, to study the average, we cannot use all the previous literature on the average complexity of matrix reduction because this is a proper subset. So we cannot do all the tricks that they are doing. Okay, so 
let me introduce you the, the characters of, of this talk. So uh, M is always going to be a matrix. And with uh, very lack of fantasy, R is the number of rows and C is the number of columns. Okay. And I'm gonna have that MI is the ith columns of my matrix. The pivot of a column is the row index of lowest and non-zero element. So I have my column MI, and then I assume that I have, I have some elements that is non-zero. Actually, in this case, I'm over zeta two, which means non-zero means it is equal to one, but still. And then I look in, okay, what is the lowest element? Is this one? And what is his row index? So let's say it's gonna be J, and this is the pivot of, uh, of my column, okay? Uh, then we have that T symbol is the number of non-zero entry in the column. So again, if we have this column here, it's gonna be, of course, it's gonna be that the number of non-zero entry is three, okay? And then we, we can, of course, have, once we have the number of non-zero entry in the columns, we have the number of non-zero entry in the whole matrix, uh, which is just the sum of all of them. Okay, so the left to right column addition, this is the only operation that we are allowing in uh, not strictly in all persistent computation, not all the variants, but today we're gonna just allow uh, left to right column addition. So what it means, it means that I have a, my matrix M and I have a certain uh, column MI and there is a previous column MJ Okay, and the only operation that I can have is instead of having, having MI, uh, let's say like this, okay, uh, I'm gonna have, instead of this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put the sum of MI plus MJ. So in this case, it's gonna be again, uh, this, this is zero, this, and this is zero. And finally, the matrix reduction is the pro process of keeping performing this operation until we have that the pivots are unique on non-zero column. So if I have my matrix that uh, has a column like this, okay. uh, this, what I'm doing is I'm starting to the left and I'm moving to the right and I'm taking, okay, this column has a unique pivot because it's the first column, so there is nothing to do. This column here has a pivot that it was already there because it's the same as the previous one. And so I'm gonna add them and this is gonna become zero, oops, too much. This is gonna become zero, this is gonna become here, and this here. And then I keep doing it until I have uh, only, non, uh, only unique pivot. Uh, why this is exactly what we wanted to do in persistent, then I'm gonna refer to uh, a video during uh, that Teresa Hayes did during the tutorial, the first tutorial. Talk. And it is very, it is very nice and very clear. She did a much better job than what I can do now for explaining you why this pivot is exactly giving you the interval of uh, the barcode. Okay. Thank you, perfect. <laughs> Okay, so what we wanted to do today, as I said, is uh, bounding complexity, which means that I need to give you a somehow measure of complexity. So how, how do we compute complexity? And the idea is saying, okay, the cost, since left to right column addition is the only operation that we're gonna do basically, we're gonna bound, uh, we're gonna define its cost. And its cost is the cardinality of the column that I'm adding. So this one. Now, if you think about it, this makes actually quite some sense because if I have MI, my column, okay, and the column MJ that I need to add, okay, okay, what is gonna happen is that if 
mj as an entry that is non zero and in the same point also m and the same row also mi has it then we're going to flip this bit from 1 to 0 we're going to delete it and if here there is an entry that here is not there okay then we're going to flip the bit from 0 to 1 okay so basically the, the cardinality, so the number of non-zero entry in MJ is telling me how many bit, bit I need to flip for, uh, for the addition. And this is, this is the right way. I mean, this is uh, uh, a good way to compute, to compute the complexity. And again, I will refer to uh, the FAT paper uh, for explaining because the, the right way to handle this addition is to have the proper data structure. And given the proper data structure, you can see that really at the computational level, it is, uh, uh, this, this number is, is uh, exactly the cost of, of this. Okay. So the cost of a metric reduction is simply, I'm gonna keep remembering uh, how much, how expensive it was to perform every column addition and then just summing up all of them quite easy. And finally, what is very important to us today is the fill up of the reduced matrix. So M prime is always going to be the reduced matrix. So what happened once all the pivots are unique? Okay. And the fill up is how dense is this matrix? Okay. Uh, so we have the matrix M prime and we have the matrix M. And what it can be, Okay, let's say that M is like this. What can be is that M prime, it has much less element. It could be, or it could be that it has many more. And the problem of understanding how much more dense or how much less dense M prime becomes is exactly the problem of understanding how expensive is the matrix reduction. So it is, it is important. Okay, so we first find our relation between the cost of reducing the matrix and the fill up of it. And this lemma is, I mean, this, this bound is so not tight, but still it's gonna be enough for our work today. So I'm gonna say that the cost is bounded by the number of columns of the matrix times the fill up of the reduced matrix. Okay, so first of all, to do that, I'm gonna introduce this notation. And those are, if this is M prime, okay, then I'm gonna have that M pri lesser equal, lesser equal I is the first I columns. So this is the I, oh, you cannot see, I column. Okay. So I'm gonna take just the sub matrix given by the first I. Okay, and then I'm gonna have that if, let's, let's assume that I have the first reduced ones, the first red, I the reduced columns, okay? So this is M prime. And then I want to reduce the I plus one one, the I plus first one, okay? Then I will add a subset of this, okay? I don't know how many, but let's say that I'm very unlucky and I'm adding all of them, okay? So it means that I can bound the cost by all of these, let's assume that I'm very unlucky and I have to add all the previously reduced columns, okay? But now this, this value is clearly less or equal than the whole entries, okay? And so I can, and which is constant with respect to I, and so this is just the number of columns. What is very interesting is that when I'm computing, so what is surprising me is that when I'm computing persistent, I may have a column that is non-zero in M, okay? But then once I reduce it, it gets a zero. And I'm, I'm usually thinking that this is, I mean, this is expensive because I need to put it to zero, but it actually is, irrelevant for our bound because there is this column does not contribute to the entries of the reduced matrix. So it's, it was a little bit of a surprise. Anyway, okay. And now 
now I can I, I'm gonna show you basically the, the key intuition between uh, behind our method. So let's say that I have this this filtration that is incidentally aviatory filtration, but it's not important. And of course, before that I have just this, and then afterwards I will have more, but this is not important. And then I will write this full boundary matrix uh, for these yeah, for these four points. Okay. And now the key is observation is to see that this is a staircase very, very easily. So what happened is that since the Vietoris rip filtration is a click filtration, as soon as I had the last edge of a triangle, I had all the triangles that, that this edge is closing, okay, and no more, then what happened is that the pivot have this shape, uh, uh, this staircase shape. Yes, I, I cannot describe it differently. Okay, so we can define when a matrix has this property of being staircase shape. And then we're going to give another couple of definitions. So we're going to say that a column of M, so this one, okay, is a step column is intuitively, it is in this, on the step of the staircase. So this, also this one will be a step column. Okay, okay. so formally, if this is the column with the smallest, the smallest column, so the smallest with the smallest index that has p as a pivot, where p is is this row. Okay. And then we're going to give another two definition, which is so a pivot. Sorry, I forgot to mention in M prime because this is the reduced matrix. Okay, is going to be a step index if it was already a pivot like this. Okay, because it was because it was a pivot here. And it is gonna be a critical index like this, if, if, you, if it is not the case. So you can see that here, the, the pivot is on the edge CD. And here, the pivot of this column was on the edge AC. So it's a new one, okay? Now, wh why do we care about this? Well, why it is important? Well, the keys observation here is that every time I have an in index that is not a step but critical, my betting number increase strictly. Okay, I'm not really going to give you a proof of this, but I will show you how it works. So the point is that I insert this edge here, okay, that create a cycle. Okay, that cannot, so the, the point is that this is not the edge that creates the triangle in this column, okay? Because this will be the pivot that is missing here. I mean, the, the element that is missing here, which means that this is create a cycle that is not a boundary. So it's strictly increasing the, the Betty numbers that, it gets killed immediately after, but it means that when I have a critical index, I'm gonna have an increase in the betting numbers. Okay, and this is basically what we needed. That and a lot of literature in the land. Yes. Ask a question? Yes. So, so here in your example, you're looking at you know one dimensional homology increases, but is this is this lemma true for any dimension of homology? No. If you let me go on a couple of slides on. Uh, I apologize. <laughs> no, no, no. It's totally fine. It's it's a very good question. So uh, the answer is yes. This is independent. So the point is, um, this this lemma in the paper is this. If M is a K click, which I'm gonna define in a few minutes. But the point is, yes, it does not depend on the, on the I mean, it's not uh, forced to be just in dimension one. Okay. Um, so what we can do now is we can study the entries of, of the reduced matrix, which I remind you will create a bound on the cost of, of my reduction. And then I can divide them between, it is a step index, so it is a step column, or it is a, a column with a critical index. 
And then this will give me this bound on, um, on the amount of, of on the fill up, so on the entries of the reducer matrix. And then this, I can actually, it's, it's, I can give you an intuition, okay? Uh, so the point is that this value is bounded by this, sorry, uh, this estimate derives from this, okay? Uh, what is, because what we are doing is, okay, let me count all the possible step columns. Well, at most, they can be the number of rows because maybe my, my filtration is such that I have exactly one step column for, for, for each row. And how many are the rows if I'm in, for example, well, if, sorry, if I'm in a click filtration with, um, with other endpoints, then I have that the number of row, so the number of edges in, uh, in degree one is roughly uh, n squared. So it goes like n squared. Okay, and then what I have is that, okay, those are the step columns, and then let me count all the possible critical index. So all the, all the other columns, right? All the other things that can be pivot. And we just saw in the lemma before that a column is uh, as a critical index, basically, if there is a change in the, in the boundary, sorry, in the betting numbers, which means that I can count this is the indicator function. So when, when do I have this property here? So I can just count when this happened, and then I'm gonna have exactly a bound on the possible number of critical index. And remember, since what we are bounding here is the entries of, M, uh, of the reduced matrix, the critical index is nevertheless a pivot. And if this is a step, so if this is an index P, that column cannot have more than P entries because I'm counting. Okay, so, so this, this finished the proof basically. Okay, so I told you that I wanted to study the average complexity, which means that I have to define a random model. Okay, and in this case, what we did is we take our N random point uh, randomly generated uh, from the uniform distribution of the d-dimensional unit cube. You choose the dimension, it doesn't matter for now, okay? And then I'm gonna build the Vietoris ribs complex where at scale alpha is given by all the synthesis with the emitters as mod alpha, classical definition of Vietoris ribs complex, maybe unnecessary in these seminars, but I hope you don't get offended. Uh, and then I'm sorting the edges by the length, so the Euclidean length uh, of, of the point, and that's it. And then I'm gonna have the Vitturis strips filter simplicial complex of so this random model is a, uh, the inclusion of click complexes where I each step, I have all the edges uh, that, so uh, at each step I, I have the click complex Ki given by all the, given over the graph that has the length, edges of a length of mass alpha i, sorry. Okay, so this is the model. And then what we have, well, we, we needed to dig quite a lot in the literature and adapt some result of scale uh, for, for getting here, but Guillaume did it. He worked uh, to fix that. Uh, so we fix alpha star as this value, and I'm not yet fixing rho because rho is fixed by this lambda. Okay, uh, so this lemma is gonna tell is telling me that if my scale is big enough, it is very unlikely that uh, I have a non-negative uh, Betty number. Sorry, I have a positive Betty number. So my Betty numbers is zero, strictly zero, not one, not increasing every little. If with high probability, if my scale is big enough, and then we're gonna have another result that is telling me that after a certain threshold, it's very unlikely that my scale is below the threshold. So these two results together tell us that it is very, so what they tell us is that it's very unlikely that above a certain threshold we have cycles, we have loops, and it's very unlikely that we stay below that threshold. So altogether they tell us that 
on the long run, eventually we're gonna get to at the step on, the, on our beta filtration where we don't have any more uh, cycles, any more loops. Can you say what you mean by, you know, stay below a threshold? So you're talking about the, the last one or the second one. So you're talking about the scale parameter here? Yes, so I'll, so the, so the threshold. Oh. No. no, sorry. Uh, your scale parameter is just uh, it's a function of the number of points. Um, no, 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 no. It's uh, sorry. Yes, it is. It is because the scales are given basically by the mutual distances by the of the points. So what I have is that I have my my points and I take the mutual distance between them for making the edges. Okay, and then basically for every new edge, I have one step of the beatory strips. So my filtration is given by every time I. Uh, I see. I, I see. So I, I is indexing the number of new simplicities. Yes, exactly, exactly. And um, uh, and not well the number of new edges because new then edges. when I close okay. when I add an edge, I also adding everything that is closing, right? Okay. Okay. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah, I wrote it maybe before, but maybe I shouldn't. Uh, so, remember, sorry, uh, I, I actually yes. did do have a. What is alpha sub i here? Uh, that's uh, so the so I have the complex. My filtration is given by uh, click complexes. Okay, get our strips. Oh, I see. So you sort all the distances in alpha. I exactly. I exactly. Smaller. I see. Okay. And then each of them has the scale alpha. Yes, that's it. Okay, I'm gonna rewrite it for the next talk. I'm gonna write it. No, 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 it's good feedback. Okay, so at the end of the day, these two results that I absolutely, so the two lemmas that I'm absolutely not gonna prove because they are a nightmare of technicality. What we have is that if M prime is the matrix, is the reduced matrix, reduced okay uh, one boundary matrix of a victorious filtration then the expected fill up is uh, o big of n square log n square and the expected cost is o big of n to the fifth uh, log square and i will tell you that the worst cases that we can have is o big of four and o big of and to the seventh. So it is, uh, I mean, our average complexity, it is actually smaller than, than the worst case complexity. So it's, uh, and, and maybe it's worth saying here that N is the number of points. Right? N because is the number of points. Let me often, repeat it. Oftentimes people think of complexity in terms of the number of simplicities, right? But the number of simplicities yes. is exponential. Yeah, that would be, that would be cubic, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So N a number of synthesis. Uh, num uh, sorry, number of points. Yes, I, I should repeat it more often. Okay, so how do we prove it? Well, first of all, we remember that there is a relation between the fill up and the one betty number, and then we use, I mean, this is simple probability. So we have, we want to compute the probability for one event, and then we compute, the, we split it into the probability of, of the event intersect with something, let's say A, and then the plus the probability of the event intersect with uh, the complement. So that's easy. And then what we have is that we can rewrite it because both probability are bigger as the, the result that we have in the two lemmas in the previous slide, uh, which means that I can use the two lemmas and then I can have that this is actually a very small probability for the proper I and the proper uh, threshold. So now I can put it back in the uh, indicator functor and I'm gonna have that, okay, I have this sum and I'm gonna split it in before the threshold uh, that the, the lemma gave me. So the lemma, the second lemma told me that after this, threshold of lambda and log n, I'm gonna have that it's very unlikely that I have a loop. And so I compute everything before and then after. And this, we just bound this probability. So what we have is that 
at the end of the day, this sum, sum can be rewritten, can be bounded by this, and this sum can be bounded by simple this one. So we have this result, and this is the leading term. And this is going to give us the how big a complexity. And now what we had is that I uh, remind you the lemma that we had at the very beginning that the cost of M is less or equal than C, so the number of columns they fill up. And then these give us this bound here because C is the number of columns, which is roughly N cube because N is the number of points. Thank you. And so the number of triangle is roughly N cube. It goes like, okay. So as, as, as Andrew pointed out nicely, what we have is that we could generalize. So the tourist filtration is a click filtration, which means that as soon as I add all the synthesis, as soon as I add the last, uh, the last edge of them. And then we can generalize this concept. I'm not gonna stay too much on this also because I'm almost at the end of, of the time slot. Uh, so the idea is that you can repeat the same things in higher dimension and say, okay, I, I want to close my, sim my simplicial complex as much as I can from the K simplices on. And so I'm gonna add just the K simplices one to one, and then I'm just gonna fill up everything else. And what we have is that then we can order the simplices such that the K boundary matrix is a staircase shape. And then we can use the, the proper generalization of, of the lemma and say, like, okay, but then if it's staircase shape, it, then we can divide the pivot into step and critical. And the critical again are linked with the uh, K dimension of Betty number. And so, uh, so in particular, we have this general bound, which means that as soon as someone give us a model and a bound on the on the probability of having a bet a non zero, the probability of no longer having a Betty num k dimensional Betty number, then I can give you back a bound on the complexity for computing that persistent, which is very nice. So in particular, we use it also. We use it again quite some reduction from the literature. Uh, we can define the Erdos-Schreni model instead of the, the Vittori strips. And there you just have N points and then you sort the edges randomly. You just give a random order and then you, your filtration is a click filtration for every new edge again. And this gives us the Erdos-Schreni model and then we we have different threshold for this, for this uh, uh, filtration. So different T and different I, which means that the bound is slightly different. So it is slightly worse in this case because it's uh, N cubed and N to the sixth instead of uh, square N uh, fifth. Uh, but still we can have it. And so then the last things probably I'm gonna talk today is, well, Okay, those are bound on the average complexity. Are those bound actually close to what we get in practice or are we still far away from, from practice? And I think is, uh, well, for the tourist strips, this is the cost of the fill up. And we are not that bad because the, what we proved it was n squared log n, and it, well, here this should be a tiny n, sorry. And the coefficient in that is n squared something. So it's, we're, we're almost there. It's, it's a very good bond. What it is not good <laughs> is the cost. Uh, so we are very, we are, we are quite good in saying, okay, the, how sparse it will be the reduced matrix, but it can be, we, we, we can still improve on the cost, the actual cost of uh, the, the complexity of the algorithm. Because what we had is that our cost it was bounded by n cubes, so the number of columns, to the fill up. So this will give us an n to the fifth log 
square n. And you can see that t is very far away from this coefficient, so this, this exponent, um, which means that this bound is really not good for Vitor strips. So it tells us that when we are when, when we are studying the Torrey strips, it's very unlikely that we have to add all the previous column to reduce a new column. Uh, so we need to be more careful about that. Uh, for the error string, I will just put it to, to let you know how, how it went. So what we have is that this is not really good because our bound is uh, n cube log n. And so the for the this is for the fill up. Okay. So what it happens is that in practice it is much faster than, than what our bound predict. But what we have is that this is more or less the fill up. Uh, so the this is the observed fill up, not our bound. Observed uh, times n cube. So what it means is that for reducing the error string, it is actually not that crazy to assume that you, we had, had to add all the previous column for reducing a new column. So it's, uh, it's telling us something about the, how the model goes. So what is happening and such, okay? Uh, then I will finish here, yes. So the point is that in the paper or in the question, if you <laughs> want to hang around afterwards, we have a construction for the error training models that actually realize the worst case. This is because the only, correct me if I'm wrong, but the only worst case construction that we have is by Mor Morozov. Yes, I hope I'm not misspelling it. From 2009, I don't remember. Okay, so I will not write it. Anyway, but this construction is linear, okay, in the number of points. So it, it, it has n points and then it has n edges and n triangles. Okay, which means that this is not a construction for the uh, click complexes, which is something that we studied today. Uh, we proved, we, it, was, it was interesting, an interesting construction, but we did find the worst case for the Erdos training model. But to realize that, uh, we cannot really realize it with the Viettori strips model. So I still don't know if the worst case can be realized by a Viettori strip filtration. Uh, and this is something that uh, I, I will like to think about it. This is admittedly not exactly my cup of tea, but maybe there are plenty of people interested in basically the phase transition of different nanofiltration. So we have a general bound that works for every time the matrix is in staircase shape. But to, to have that, we need a probability bound on the model, which means that I'm basically asking everybody working on probability or random filtration to, to give me back more, more bound on the, when the Betty numbers goes to zero. And uh, I mean, I'm very happy to discuss this, even if uh, I'm probability theory is a little bit far away from uh, what I uh, usually do. And then of course, I should, I mean, we should refine the estimates. So we, we saw that even, uh, I mean, this is the first, uh, one of the first, work on the average complexity. The other one uh, was studying only the shuffle filtration and it was uh, Michael Kaba and uh, Hannah Schreiber. Uh, and they had they needed a variant of, of the standard precision algorithm. Uh, but I am not aware of any other, any other result. So it was a good start, but we still need to do more. So we, need, we still need to improve the estimate and everything. And that will be all. Thank you. I suggest we unmute ourselves to thank Barbara for a wonderful talk. Are there any questions? I, I can start. I have one question. Um, I think it was slide number 12, if I remember correctly. Okay. 
but yes, yeah, so I'm going to ask uh, if you, what was the dimension of the, uh, say, uh, product space inside which you calculated things? It was a dimension too. I was wondering if um, the gap that you uh, mentioned exists between the predicted complex, average complexity, and what you observe, what, what happens to that gap as a dimension D increases? That's, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I think we, no, we, maybe Guillaume is here and can even correct me, but I think we tested only in dimension two because we, we wanted to have a certain number of vertices like high and uh, higher the dimension, it's uh, harder to get tested. But the answer is, I don't know. So uh, we should do more experiment and, and test it. So the thing is that the general bound, uh, so in the, where it is, the probability, aha. Uh -huh. So uh, this is the iteration that we get in, in the, in the in the theory and this does depend on the dimension somehow so uh, we we also need to take care of to check uh, that yeah. even if this does not really appear here at the end yeah um, the intuition that, that i have is that the, the larger the ambient space dimension the more random your sample metric space will be and yes. the more random it becomes i would expect that to lead to finding similarity with the behavior of uh, the Erdos Rengi, mm. but that's that yes that's that's a reasonable that's a reasonable hypothesis um, I don't know but thank you for pointing it out because we will stop it oh, yes I, I forgot to say that this paper is available on the archive and we got accepted at Isaac so it's uh, uh, it's not just appropriate we, someone check it our result, which is important. Are there any other questions or comments? Mm. May I ask a question? Please. Uh, thank you. Your uh, formula, this uh, calculating the cost of M, uh, which is mm -hmm. less than this, the number of columns. How sharp is this inequality? Not, and, uh, not sharp, yeah? Not sharp, no. Uh, so, at I least... Mean, uh, mm, okay, please. No, no, please, okay. Uh, um, I just mentioned, can we work on that, uh, of course, uh, before uh, going further to yes. make this sharper? To, for example, using randomized uh, algorithm or something like that to, uh, to make, the, not to choose all the, columns some of them or yes that, that was that was basically one of the direction in which we wanted to go uh so the point is that if so this is anyway uh, related to the number of points okay so it's a uh, uh, a power of it let, let's say uh, p okay which means that even if we just reduce this by even one exponent is already much better. Uh, so yes, uh, the the one of the first new direct. I mean, one of the first next step will be: can we do better on this lemma? And uh, the experiment suggests that not really for the Erdos training, but definitely for the Vittori strips. So maybe it does depend on the complex. We cannot really say something for the general complexes like we did uh, for general clique complexes. Uh, but yes, there is definitely room uh, for improvement here. And uh, yes. Uh, of course, uh, this, is, this is just a rough idea. I, I was thinking to, to, uh, to use the ideas from combinatorial matrix theory, zero one matrix mm -hmm. ideas like min max theorem. And, I, I maybe it is independent line of research, but I feel uh, we can do something, but it needs more thought. Uh, the only thing that I can say is that I agree. Yes, <laughs> it's uh, it's definitely worth it to look at it. And uh, yeah. I mean, any thank input is much. welcome. So thank you. Thank you very much. Very nice talk. I wanted to ask a question about um, the first bullet on your last slide. Um, yes. So, uh, 
it's very inefficient is uh, my tablet just for skipping oh, no one slide to the other but yeah you're so doing I, I think this bullet was about uh, worst case constructions and, and you mentioned this uh, worst case construction by Morozov. so this is a um this is a um he he constructed a worst case filtration where you're saying that the matrix reduction algorithm is sort of um um, has as much fill up as it possibly could. Is that right? Yes, yes. So that's that's the point of of creating the worst case. You need to have so this. Those were my backup, uh, but I, I was slower. So the idea is that a good exercise is finding even one column that is n square dense. So it has n square element into it. And then the next step would be, okay, now find n square columns that have that many entries. And that would already give you the fill up of n4, which is the, the worst case. But it is, it is tricky uh, to, to, because the point is that you need to have a column that pass through a lot of other columns such that the entries do not cancel themselves. And uh, it, was, it was not obvious uh, to, to find it out. And I still don't know how to find one example of this. I mean, just one dense column for a Vittorio strip complex. And, and one question I had about that. So you said that you, you did have some worst case constructions for Erdős Renyi. Yes. But, but Erdős Renyi is sort of like a, it's a random graph and then you take the click thereof. I mean, any, any graph can be the, you know, one skeleton of some, of some distance matrix. So why, why is the Erdős Renyi example not also, a, oh, you mean Vitor strips in a Euclidean space? In a Euclidean space, ah, yes. So, so, I, I see, I see, I see. So my problem is that I can always, so in the Erdős Renyi, as you said, I can, I can decide the order which means and it is crucial to decide the order of to, to have all this fill up. I don't know if you can prove that this is always realizable. The, so the, whatever the, the specific order that I choose for the, my worst case is always realizable in a, in a Euclidean space, then I'm done. I have it the Vitor strength. But I uh, don't think it's possible. Because but but it, it is realizable in the Euclidean space of some dimension, like yes. Like, but the point is, I I mean, for for getting the worst cases, you need to have you have your number of points, right? And it needs to go to infinity, and which means that every time you, the, you the, need the dimension would have to go to infinity. Exactly, yeah, exactly. I see, I see. So that that's the issue there. Yes. Let me ask uh, one more question, if that's okay. Please. So um, in your columns, you have sort of uh, two types of pivots, a critical pivot or a- um, step, step pivot, I think we call it. Step pivot. And then um, at some stage, you're relating like the number of step pivots to the um, homology, right? And that's- The number of critical uh, pivot, yes. Okay, the number of critical pivots to homology. And so you're sort of um, using, you know, in the Euclidean case, you're using Kale's work to show yes. that since the homology is is not that. No, sorry, good. sorry, sorry. Um, the Kale result is about uh, the Vietor, when the Vietori strips stop to have Betty numbers, so one dimensional Betty numbers. But right. the re the relation between the critical index and the, the change in the, the Betty numbers, this, this is absolutely independent from the Euclidean uh, space. It is independent on the model. That's right, that's right. So if any model, if you had a bound analogous to chaos, you could apply your machinery. But, but I'm trying to understand, um, I'm under, trying to understand how your argument goes. So, mm -hmm. so let's say you have um, some bound like chaos in the specific case of the Euclidean model, that bounds the homology, you're using that to bound the number of um, critical. And then, um, uh, and, and then the way I should think of these critical events is, I mean, um, in a click filtration, sometimes I add an edge and a triangle appears at the same time, filling in the hole. But, mm -hmm. but, but you're really saying that you're, you're bounding the number of edges that don't have a triangle appearing at the same yes. time. Yes, okay. yes, yes, exactly, exactly. It is, 
uh, as as I mentioned, it is a little weird because we are not considering the columns that at the end of the of the reduction of zero, even if we technically added many. So you will think that they do they are important for for the complexity, but with this model they are not. And so the only things that matter is so basically what what the bound of K, for example, is telling us is that after a certain point, all your column will become zero. You will not really get a column that you have to reduce that has a low pivot and it is not zero. Right. So it is very unlikely that the further you go. And uh, yes, so this, this is maybe the relation between the, how, you, how to think about it. Great, thanks so much. May I ask one more question? Absolutely. Uh, in the same direction, this I'm curious. This terminology of critical is uh, is by accident, or is there any relation with this more uh, function in those criticals? Um, yes and no. Yes, in the sense that the name critical makes you think that there is something going on. So there is something homological, let's say, that changes it. But we were not thinking about more theory at all when, when we noticed this, or I was not thinking about it. Uh, oh, thank you. So it's just a name that reminds of that. Uh, OK, thank you. Are there any more questions or comments for Barbara? If not, well, thanks again, Barbara, and I'm going to stop recording now, but if people want to uh, stay around and ask more questions, that's fine.